It is my pleasure to um, introduce to you the wonderful, the legendary Joe Clifford. Joe is a writer, a performer, a poet, and a teacher based in Edinburgh. She is the author of about 80 plays, can you believe that, 80 plays, many of which have been translated into various languages and performed all over the world. She is Associate, of Art, Associate Artist of the Chris Good and Company. Her transition from John to Joe has enabled her to become an actor and a performer. She will be performing the London premiere, in fact she's already been performing the London premiere, of her renowned play, The Gospel According to Jesus, Queen of Heaven. And we're inaugurating that at Draper Hall. So, without much further ado, please welcome Joe. Thank you. How lovely to be here. Um, as, as, as you know, we are um, speaking under some difficulty because we are having to contend with a very serious global shortage. I refer, of course, to the global shortage of pronouns. <laughs> if you just think about it for a moment, she, he, el, il, ella, el, ella, ele. How pathetic is that? <laughs> How completely inadequate to deal with the enormous varieties of gender expression that there are in the world the enormous varieties of gender expression that there are in this room and in the room upstairs. It's just not good enough, is it? And the first thing I want to tell you is that this division between men and women, this gender binary that we completely take for granted, is actually, for many, many other cultures and many other cultures in the world and at different times in the world, it's not common sense. It's recognized as something completely inadequate. Because so many other cultures, in so many other different places and in so many other different times of human history, have understood that there are more than two genders. And I hope that we are living in a time where not only are we beginning to move towards a more fuller, a more generous and a more humane understanding of what it is to be a woman and what it is to be a man, but we are also moving towards a time in which it's recognized that there are three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten genders at least. And they are all beautiful because they are all part of the amazing, wonderful diversity of life that is unfolded before our eyes outside this window. And that if you take a child, if you're bringing up a child and you force that child to live according to gender norms that do not belong to them, that are not appropriate to them, then you are causing great suffering to that child. I would, I would argue that it's a form of abuse. And if I manage to say nothing else today, those are the two most important things. The other week, the other week I had to write one of those, uh, one of those little potted biographies, um, and it was kind of unusual because they wanted to know a little bit about my childhood. I ended up saying, Joe Clifford. She was born in North Staffordshire in 1951, where she was raised as a boy. Because I wanted to try to express the dislocation that I suffered from a very early age, in which I grew up being convinced was my fault, but actually no, it wasn't my fault. It was because I grew up in a society, in a place and in a time which did not understand. And my poor mum and dad did their very best for me, but they also caused me great, great suffering and damage. One of my earliest memories when I was four years old is of looking in the mirror and not altogether recognizing the boy I saw there. Something didn't seem to be right. Because in my experience, and, is, and mostly in our experience, this happens at a very young age. 
It's at the moment when we first begin to distinguish who we are and understand ourselves as beings separate in the world. And I also had a sense that this was something that was dangerous to talk about. This was something that I would somehow have to deal with on my own. This was something non-negotiable somehow. And I did my very best because I didn't know what was going on. I did my very best just to pretend nothing was happening and hope it would go away. But of course, it didn't go away. And as I got bigger, another very early memory is of seeing a neighbor's doll. Oh, it was the most beautiful doll. She had blonde hair and those eyelashes, great big gorgeous eyelashes that open and shut according to where you, the angle you hold her at. And I had to have her. <coughs> there was nothing I could do about this. I had to have her. And the only way I could have her was to steal her. And I went away and I locked myself in the downstairs loo and my dad knocked on the door. And in a terrible, terrible voice, he said, come out of there at once. And I knew that my sense that this was something to, too dangerous to talk about was correct. And looking back on it, it's very easy to see that what was happening was what we now call gender dysphoria. But words like that didn't exist in the early 50s. There weren't even words like transgendered or trans transsexual. None of these concepts existed. So neither me nor my mum and dad nor my teachers, we had no mechanism to understand what was happening. The conceptual tools simply did not exist. And it's a measure of how far the world has changed. Changed for the better, I would say that I am now able to stand up here in front of you wearing a dress as if it was the most natural thing in the world. And yet now, when I was a boy, when I was forced to live as a boy, such a thing would have seemed completely impossible. And probably if you were to try to make sense of my life, you could say that my whole life has been about trying to understand that moment. Those two moments, those moments looking in the mirror, not recognizing myself, and that other moment of very small, brief, snatched moment in terror and in shame in the downstairs loo while my dad hammered on a door. And as I got bigger, I really wanted to wear <coughs> girls' clothes. I couldn't understand that. That made no sense at all. That was a terrible thing to want as far as I was concerned. But it was there. And when I was about 14, I was sent to a boys' boarding school. A lot of effort was put into trying to turn me into a man. It didn't work very well. <laughs> uh, I was at a boys' boarding school, and uh, they put on school plays, and I was offered a part in the play, <coughs> playing a girl. Sylvia in One Way Pendulum by N.F. Simpson. And I took it and I loved it. The moment I stepped into the rehearsal room, I felt happy. I felt at ease. I felt there was a place for me in the world. I wasn't shy anymore. I was confident. In some way that completely took me by surprise, I knew exactly what I was doing. And again, looking back on it, it's very clear that it was at that moment that I understood my vocation in life as a theatre maker, both as a performer and an actress and a writer. But as this went on for a couple of years, and of course I loved being on stage, I loved wearing, a, I loved wearing the clothes, I loved having the wig, I loved that funny feeling of slight heaviness when you have full side lashes on. And you're aware of, of, of blinking your eyes, fluttering your eyelashes, that's the expression. I loved 
fluttering my eyelashes. <laughs> but then, as I got a bit bigger, and ad adolescence kicked in, I realized these were terrible, shameful things to be feeling. I also understood that actually I would be much happier living as a girl. And that was impossible. This was 1964, 1965, in a hugely conventional boys' public school in England. What an impossible, dangerous place I was in. The only thing I could do was try to repress this, try to deny this very profound truth about myself, and live as a normal boy. And that's what I tried to do. And because I loved acting, I kept trying to go for boys' parts, but I couldn't do it. I was too ashamed. And so the minute I found my vocation, I lost it. And theater became a place of fear and shame. And again, if you wanted to, to try to make sense of my life, you could say that my life from that moment on was about trying to recover from that truly, truly dreadful trauma that I suffered from at that age. And it took a long time. It took me 20 years to find myself as a theater writer. And it took me 20 years after that to rediscover myself, rediscover my joy in acting and in performing. So it was 40 years. 40 years of very, very intense struggle. And it's no coincidence, it seems to me, that these were also connected, intimately connected, with my long struggle to come to accept myself. I was very lucky, I think. I was lucky because I knew I was a writer from a very young age. Don't ask me why or how that happened, but that's what I knew. And I was also incredibly lucky because when I was 21, oh, i tell you something else that saved my life. I, uh, I was working in a, in a psychiatric hospital in the borders, and I wanted to find out about Freud. So I asked a, a, a psychiatrist in the hospital, and he recommended this book, Eric Erickson, Childhood and Society. I expect you probably know it, actually. Um, and there's a section in there, it's a very extraordinary, beautiful book, I still remember it, that not only outlined Freud's theories of childhood development, but it also spoke about what happens, how different cultures bring up their children. And there was a section about the uh, Native Americans of the, of the plains. Uh, these were people who listened to and paid attention to their dreams. When a boy was in the process of preparing to go into manhood, there was a dream that seemed to, kept, seemed to keep recurring. A dream of being confronted by the goddess of the moon. And the moon held up two symbols. The moon held up a bow and arrow in her right hand. That's a symbol of manhood. And a burden strap in her left hand, the symbol of womanhood. And what the boy in the dream had to do was choose. And he might choose the bow and arrow and so grew up to be a man. Or he might try to choose the bow and arrow and then somehow find himself, find the moon had swapped and he was holding the burden strap. And if he kept having that dream, he had the right to go to the elders of the tribe and renounce manhood and take on women's clothes and adopt women's customs and women's occupations. And I so wanted, I so wanted to be able to do that. But I can't tell you what a comfort it was for me in my dreadful isolation and my shame to discover that somewhere in this world there had once been, and for all I knew, maybe there still even existed, a society in which people like myself not only lived, but could be accepted and respected for who we were. Knowledge of history is a very powerful thing. And then something else quite extraordinary happened to me. I fell in love. 
I'm, I hope you all believe in love at first sight, because I do. I know it happens. The minute I saw Susie, my partner, I fell in love with her, and she fell in love with me, and we were terrified. But eventually we got together. And we stayed together for 33 years until she died of a brain tumor. And during that time, she was able to discover herself as a, as a feminist historian. And I was able to discover myself as a playwright. And we also brought up two daughters. And we shared the care of our daughters. It was as if, it was as if this room would be a could be a model of, of our lives. So one half of our lives I would spend looking after the children and then the other half I would spend working as a, as a playwright and she would be the same. So I was mother and father to my children and she was as well. And the experience of bringing up children was so important to me because in looking after my girls when they were babies, it helped me get in touch with what we're trained to call our mater my maternal side, because they love me. Children love you unconditionally. And that taught me that I had to try to learn to begin to love myself. And because Susie loved me, and I loved Susie. And we had a remarkably happy family for all those 33 years. That saved my life. And I would say also that discovering I was a playwright, which happened more or less at the same time as my eldest daughter was born, and that was not a coincidence. That was an extraordinary moment. Because then I discovered that I could make women, a woman, the central character in my plays. And I could also have a, an equal mix of men and women in the cast. And all that enabled me to explore my femininity in ways that otherwise would not have been possible for me. And I always used to go away and um, work in a room separate from the house because you probably also all know how impossible it is to try and do creative work when young children are around because they so hate it when you withdraw your attention from them and go into your work. And that meant that I could wear dresses and skirts, whatever I wanted to, as I wrote. And all this, all this nourished me. All these were, were milestones on my journey to discovering myself. It's important, I think, to say that I, didn't, I never identified myself as a transsexual during those years. I saw myself as someone who was bi-gendered. My task in life, as far as I could tell, was to try to come to terms with the feminine inside me. Because, as I know, you're all aware, men, every man has a woman inside him. And every woman has a man inside him. And what we have to do as human <coughs> beings is try to or reach a point where the masculine and the feminine are in harmony with each other and aren't at war with each other. And I saw that as my task in life. Only, unfortunately, I couldn't do it because the feminine inside me was so very strong. And I started to break down. It's called a breakdown, isn't it? where you simply can't function anymore. And although these are considered to be very terrible things, they actually can be the doors into new life and new understanding. I remember one day, I'd become a university professor. I was terribly successful by that stage. Um, <laughs> I had a good university career. I was, I was well known and respected as a, as a playwright, as John Clifford. I had these gorgeous daughters and this wonderful wife and a happy family. But somehow, <coughs> In my heart of hearts, I knew something was wrong. And one, night, one day I went to work at the university, and it was the beginning of a new term, and there was the timetable. And I looked at it at my desk, and I couldn't understand it. 
figure. It, it made no sense to me at all. I didn't know what it meant. I didn't know what I was supposed to be doing, and I started to cry. And I cried and I cried. And a dear colleague and friend had said to me, she said, you know, John, sometimes we break our leg, and our leg doesn't work, and it has to rest. And sometimes our mind doesn't work, and it has to rest. Go home. Go home. And I went home with the feeling that my life had come to an end. And that night I had a dream. And in the dream, I was driving along a road in Italy. Maybe you've been to Italy. You know those motorways that go right over these astonishing valleys. Deep, deep ravines in the mountainside across by dazzling, extraordinary viaducts. And I was driving along and suddenly... I came to a halt because the road had ended. And I got out of the car, and I looked down, and I saw the abyss. The road had come to an end. And I had a moment of sick, sick terror. And then I looked up, and I started to look around me, and I could see that there were two carriageways to this road and that there was a kind of rocky bit in between them, a rough, rocky bit, and I could travel across. And I don't think in the dream I took the first step, but I knew I could. When I woke up of the days to come, I understood that this dream meant that I could no longer go on living as a man, that I had to stop living as a man and start living as a woman. And I can't tell you how terrifying that realization was. And it kept being terrifying in the years to come. <coughs> because although John was very unhappy, John had accomplished a great deal. John could function really well in this world. And the suffering I, I was continually suffering from, well, at least it was suffering I knew about. At least it was suffering I could deal with. But moving over to Joe was a step totally into the unknown. And I think at this moment it's perhaps worth reminding you and making clear that this journey I took, although this journey was about gender, is a journey that we must all take. Because at the end of the day this wasn't simply about me traveling from a male identity to a female identity. This journey has been about me trying to discover myself. This is a journey about a child who was told the wrong things about themselves. This is a child that was told lies about who they were. And this happens to everybody. Part of what schooling is about is telling us lies about ourselves. Often telling us we're stupid. Often telling us that all we can accept from life is to sit in a dreary room at work where we're not satisfied and we're not fulfilled. And then we go home and we try and console ourselves in front of the television or whatever it is we've just bought. Everybody, everybody in this world is told lies about who we are. And the lies that I, were told, I was told take a particularly, let's say, a particularly dramatic form. And the steps I've had to take have been very remarkable, I suppose, in a way. Certainly very conspicuous. By that stage, I was pretty well known in Scotland as a playwright. John Clifford was something of a public figure. And then John Clifford had to become Joe Clifford in public. That was frightening. But certain things always <coughs> stayed the same. I remember when I told my daughters, and this was after my, my wife had died, I said, I'm so sorry, loves, I can't go on living as a man. I have to 
try to discover what it is to live as a woman. And I said, I don't know what's going to happen. I will probably change, but I don't know how I'm going to change. And my daughter said, oh, Dad, don't change your voice. I said, no, I promise. <laughs> I won't change my voice. But I also said to them, whatever happens, I will always be your dad. And I will always love you. Because love, through all these changes that all of us are called to go through in our lives, love remains constant. But of course, love is also changing. Because we're all growing on this journey. And we're all discovering new meanings and new dimensions to love just as we discover new dimensions to life. I was extraordinarily lucky, I think. Extraordinarily lucky, because on this journey, I was also able to keep exploring. I kept writing all the way through this. I wrote her, I remember, very specially, I was asked to adapt Goethe's Faust for the stage. I, I hope you know Goethe's Faust. I think it's the most incredible, incredible piece of work. And you'll know that in part one, part one is a kind of very masculine bit, but in part two, part two ends with this extraordinary expression. It's through the female that the world is set free. Part two is a total exploration that Goethe made of his own feminine self. Dear love, he was very frightened of part two. He locked it up. He locked up the manuscript in a chest with strict instructions that no one was to open it until he was dead. Part two is the most extraordinary revolutionary document because part two foresees the end of patriarchy. And that, of course, is another stage that, as a society, we're all going through. But when it came to dramatizing this show, I invented a character called the poet, who was in poem part one. The poet was a man. And in part two, the poet had become a woman. And that was a dramatization of what I was going through at the time. But I also got to be very interested in... In the Bible, this surprised me a little bit, but I, I, I've always thought that we are spiritual beings as, 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 as well as everything else, and that drama should address our spiritual selves. And I really wanted to understand why churches hate people like myself with such intensity. What is that about? Where does that come from? And of course, one place it comes from is the Bible and the story of our creation. Remember that? How the world began? Remember the story of Adam and Eve? Remember the words, male and female, created he them? I discovered that's actually a mistranslation. That probably what it means is male and female. God created us. In other words, that the first human being was an androgyne. And it was probably because that, that story was just a little bit ambiguous that they had to invent another one, the story of Adam and Eve. The story of Adam and Eve that tells us that enormous lie. The enormous lie being, of course, that women come out of men. That woman was created from man's from Adam's rib. What a monstrous, absurd <laughs> falsehood that is. Because as we all know, or we should know, and though isn't it interesting, isn't it interesting how this knowledge has somehow been kept from us and how hard it sometimes is to, to take that on board. Women don't come out of men. Men come out of women. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I wrote a play around that called God's New Frock. 
And then, to my astonishment, it did really well in Italy. They loved it in Italy. <laughs> so I decided I'd, um, I'd write a sequel about the New Testament. And a bit to my surprise, it was Jesus who was talking. So that was how my play, The Gospel According to Jesus, Queen of Heaven, came about. And it imagines Jesus as a transgendered woman coming back to earth in the present day. And so how does she tell her familiar stories? What has she got to say to our world? Well, of course, what she has to say to our world is very simply that the hatred of homosexuals or transsexuals, the hatred of LGBT people that is still so prevalent in so many churches in this world has no foundation whatsoever in the Gospels. Because the Gospels call on us to love each other to love each other as we love ourselves. That's such a profound command. And as I began to work on the play, I discovered that, of course, I had to learn to love myself, which was very difficult because I'd been taught to hate and despise myself. But the play, as I conceived it, was an act of devotion, an act of devotion to the Christ of the Gospels. And so I was astonished when I turned up for the first performance and find the whole street outside the theatre was full of hundreds and hundreds of people all protesting because apparently I was being blasphemous. <coughs> somebody, somebody turned up with a placard that read, God says my son is not a pervert. <laughs> Pretty profound statement, isn't it? <laughs> and some other dear loves had turned up with the Virgin Mary. Because apparently I had insulted the Virgin Mary by suggesting that Jesus would be anything other than a white heterosexual man. <laughs> And thus, oddly enough, this is still going on. Um, I, I discovered that somebody got very cross about the banner outside Draper Hall last night and graffitied it and tore it down. And I can remember also that week, the Archbishop of Glasgow denounced me. One of the best reviews I've ever had. <laughs> The Archbishop of Glasgow said it is hard to imagine a greater affront to the Christian faith than me. <laughs> Very dangerous person to be in the room with. And the, the, the protest got filmed and it went all around the world and there were literally, if you, if you googled the gospel according to Jesus, Queen of Heaven in that week, you would find there were about Three, four hundred thousand, four hundred thousand people all around the world had opinions about me. Most of them hated me, but a few really loved me, and they kept me going. But also I thought, although I was traumatized and terrified, I thought, I'm on to something here. Because when people hate you, they're hating something important in themselves. And I thought I must carry on, and so I have. So here I am. And I would say to you that the key to everything, and I'm sure the key to your work, is love. It's how can we help each other love each other and love each other through loving ourselves. And these things are both sequential <laughs> but they're also simultaneous because time is not just the boring 24-hour time that we're used to. <coughs> time has another dimension. In my new play, Eve, strangely enough I seem to be working my way through New Testament women, or bi biblical women, uh, I talk about queer time. Straight time is a time of plots, 
Queer time is something else. Queer time is open, creative, full of life and love and plenitude. Thank you. Is this working? Yes, it is. Okay, that, what an extraordinary, moving, and brave, and, and humorous, humorous talk from Joe. That really was absolutely fantastic. We've got about 15 minutes for questions, so um, if you could put your hand up and wait for the microphone to find its way to you. Actually, that's me. That's because I understand about that boring old straight time. <laughs> Quite proud of myself. <laughs> Hi, thank you. Um, I wanted to ask you, uh, th thanks for really this very nice talk. It was also full of hope. And in, my, uh, I, in Italian, uh, we say immaginifico, which like, I don't know if you have a similar word in English. Immaginifico? <laughs> wow. Yes, which you means... should have. Which <laughs> you should have that word. Yeah. yeah, which means that through imagination you, like think of a better world and but um i wanted to ask you um what do you one i mean what what are your what's your opinion about something which often comes to our mind when we think about a better world and because i think that often also in these experiences there is um uh, I mean, f let's say in trance, trance experience, just to make an example, but also in other experiences, and also in, in being a woman and so through feminism, there is uh, um, a certain amount of um, opposition to, of uh, necessity to oppose, to contrast a certain order. Um, and if one thing in a, to an in, uh, uh, theor theoretically, it's one thing to a world in which these boundaries are not there, then there is uh, full freedom and so on. Then also, the strength of these, I don't know, the strength of the feminist thought or the strength of the trans uh, experience uh, seems to weaken, no? To to be weaker than. Uh, that's what. what <laughs> well, that's what, what. What do you think about it? Whether. In a in a in a better world, there will be less need to be trans or to be feminist or to be. <laughs> to well, be. gosh, that's a that's a good question. That's a very profound question. I'm very proud of myself that I managed to unscrew the bottle and pour myself a glass of water without <laughs> pouring it all over myself. And I think I managed to follow what you were saying. <laughs> <laughs> when I was uh, when I was just beginning this journey. Uh, I remember I was walking down the Royal Mile in Edinburgh and a man stopped me and he said, excuse me, madam. He was a bit drunk. And I was so pleased he called me madam because I used to be tormented by the fact that every time people s saw me, they called me sir or they assumed I was a male. And that was wrong. But this man had called me madam and I was so happy with him. And then he suddenly looked at me again and he went, Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> oh, that's terrible. Oh, I'm so sorry. So sorry. I thought, what? What are you sorry about? <laughs> and then I understood that actually he was sorry because in his eyes he had just insulted me. He had called me a woman. And if one man wants to insult another man, he calls him a woman. And that was an extraordinary... I'm so grateful to that man because that was an extraordinary moment of understanding just how profoundly, atrociously misogynist our culture is. And it's so misogynist and we have to... Oh, another story. My mum. Once I was with my mum driving to Cheltenham and she was going to put me on the, on the train to, 
take me to boarding school. So it was a very sad journey. And in Cheltenham in those days, do you remember gasometers? Do you remember those great big structures where they used to store gas? And there was a horrible smell all around this gasometer. And all there were houses all around. And I said, Mum, that's, that's horrible. How horrible these poor people that have to live in these houses. And she said, well, the thing is that you get used to it, and then you don't notice it. Well, culturally, we have all got used to an atrocious level of misogyny, an appalling level of despising women, fearing women. We don't notice it anymore. And of course, as because you and I, we were brought up to be boys, and boys in particular are taught not simply to despise women that, 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 that they encounter in the world, but to despise and fear the woman inside themselves. And that was a major, major source of my suffering, because I actually despised and I hated myself. And my hope, my, yeah, my hope is that as we progress... It's that hatred, it's that fear, it's that horrible, horrible lack of respect that we grow out of. And who knows, who knows what will come of that. But wouldn't it be, wouldn't it be wonderful if little boys were truly allowed to wear dresses if they wanted to? What a, what a, what a, what a, that's a very simple thing, isn't it? What difference would that make to all of us? What kind of world would there be if that was just taken for granted? One of the things that really cheers me up, actually, is, uh, I mean, God, I'm in my late 60s. But when, I, when I'm with young people, uh, my producer, Annabelle, who's around here somewhere, she runs something called Dive, which is a, queer, a series of queer theme nights, let's say, uh, and which... Every, every gender and every sexuality is welcome. And you go to a dive event, and you meet people, and you think, oh, now, is that a man who's going to be trying to become a woman, or is that a woman who's trying to become a man, or is that a man and a woman at the same time? I don't know. And isn't that wonderful? So I think, I really do think that a new freedom is slowly being born. Because of, yeah, I'll just say that. A new freedom <laughs> is slowly being born. Thank you. We still have time for a few more questions. Hi. Um, thanks, Joe, for uh, a really positive a staggeringly positive presentation of uh, your your experience, um, and and I guess for me it provoked two very powerful um, oppositions. I guess to you, uh, one is uh, regarding class issues, and the other is regarding religion. Um, <clears throat> with, with with class, um, you, you you said several times in your talk that you were very lucky. You were extraordinarily lucky. Um, in, in the way you were able to um, get through your changes. Um, most of the trans people that I talk to are not privileged. They're horrifically scared of even walking out of, the uh, out of their houses. Um, they are subject to being killed. Um, there was a recent um, uh, thing on television about the Brazilian... Yeah transsexual who was brutally beaten to death while begging for her life. Um, they can't afford um, gender surgery, they can't afford therapy, and they are scrambling around uh, coping through addiction with their pain. Um, so that, that's kind of one issue, and I'm wondering if that's represented in your dramatic work and how you represent that as a class issue. Because, you know, we've got the Caitlyn Jenner's Janet Mock, the celebrities. Uh, I guess in Britain we could talk about Paris Lees and possibly even yourself as people who've made it. <clears throat> but, but what about 
the others who remain invisible and how are they represented uh, in your plays. Um, the second issue is, um, <laughs> whilst I was absolutely delighted with what you were saying about your work with religion, um, you know, we can't get past a synod agreeing same-sex marriage, let alone trans issues. Um, and this leads me to the problem of hate. And it seems that religion does not appear to have the psychological capacity for love, even though its political propaganda is that it is a gospel of love. The reality is it has a psychological capacity for hate, and that is what it structures in society, which is why it's so popular. And, and the, the, the most hurtful thing about the American elections was all those posters that said, love trumps hate. Um, not true. Okay, Hate trumped love, and Trump hates love. And we've now got executive orders that are reversing Barack Obama's LGBTQ rights. So I'm wondering, again, how this is represented dramatically <clears throat> as points of conflict um, and how your deep belief in love somehow might be able to move through that hate in religion and also um, give some space for the class issues of the many trans people who are frankly being obliterated um, psychologically and emotionally. Well, I, I gosh, you, you go in for difficult questions in this gallery, don't you? Sorry. Um, uh, <laughs> if you want to find out how I deal with it dramatically, you'll have to come and see the play. Okay. Sorry, there's no other option, and I'm not, not going not to say anything else about that. Uh, what I would say is that I went through many years where I could not go out the front door without somebody shouting abuse at me or laughing at me to my face or saying hurtful things to each other in front of me as if I wasn't there. This, I mean, what, what, what we're talking about is not goes way beyond class. And for many years, God, we went through such desperate poverty. So in myself, somehow I know it is possible to go through this. I would also say that um, my play has been translated into Portuguese. O Evangelho segundo Jesus, Reina do Seu. It is being presented in Brazil tonight. Uh, by an extraordinary, courageous uh, trans woman, travesti, Renata Carvalho. You have to go to Brazil. <laughs> you really want to find out the effect it's doing there. And I tell you, it is having a very, very profound effect there. I performed it in Brazil last year, just at the time, uh, just after the right-wing coup, Temer. Uh, and the first thing that these right-wing demagogues do is they try to repeal trans rights. And they do it in the name of the family and in the name of Christianity. And I gave a whole load of interviews at that time saying, firstly, I am a Christian because I am a Christian and I go to church and I am totally accepted. I read the lesson often. My, so Christianity, hatred is not something that is an endemic to Christianity. The capacity for hatred is something that is universal. And it's not a good plan to blame religion for it. Yeah? That's the first thing I would say. And the second thing I said to these people is that I am a family person. I have two daughters who I love profoundly. And I have a grandson. I said, I am a father and a grandmother. <laughs> and I put on the play I remember performing the play I was very frightened because it, this is a very dangerous country to be transsexual Brazil it's not as dangerous as many others <coughs> I tell you the reason we know and it's remarkable that we know about these cases that you mentioned of Dandara who was killed in the street and the revulsion and the anger that that has caused in Brazil. There are many, many countries where such a thing goes on every single day. There are many countries in this world where I 
would be dead. Most of the Middle East, most of Russia, most of Africa. And what is happening, what is extraordinary about the play in Brazil, when, the, when, the, when uh, Renata first performed it, there was a man wandering around with a gun. There were determined attempts to close down. They had to close down their first venue and move to another venue. But there was a procession of people coming out in support. A whole group of women, some of whom were pregnant, others of whom were carrying small children, turned up at the box office and they said, we know we can't get a ticket to see the show, but we want to form a circle of protection around Renata to keep her safe. And last time I was in Brazil, in November, again, performing the show, trans women came up to me and they said, with tears in their eyes, you have no idea the effect this play is having on us. This is helping us so much. So I would say to you, whatever the faults of my play, and there are many faults, there are many things I don't cover, what I have discovered through this play is that art can change the world and change the world for the better. And it is the duty of every artist to reflect on the moral consequences of what we create. And that art, the function of art, in these times, these terrifying times, where nothing is working anymore, our political systems don't work, our economic systems don't work, our understanding of gender doesn't work, a new world is coming. This is like the end of the Middle Ages, what we're going through. And our job as artists and your job as thinkers is to dream the new world into being. Thank you. Thank you, guys.